Hello, I'm Mick Fellows. I was a fleet clearance diving officer, second in command of fleet clearance diving team number one during the Falklands campaign in 1982. D-Day was on the 21st of May. We went into St. Carlos water on the Sir Tristram with two or three warships and a couple of other RFAs. At about half past three in the morning, a lot of trips, troops started landing onto Red Beach by landing craft. At 11 o'clock, I was given past a pink secret signal, which in fact said, HMS Antrim has an unexploded weapon on board and requires assistance. My chopper came in fairly low and the pilot advised me to get myself into the sling so that they could lower me down from the helicopter on a wire onto the after deck of Antrim. And he said it might be a bit dodgy because Antrim obviously can't stop and can't stop on a steady course while they're lowering me. Uh, so I had a warning. As we were coming in, uh, I, I was looking down all the time at Antrim and I heard an, a loud bang and clattering noise and looked up. And as I looked up, I could see streaks of flame shooting out of two aircraft that were coming in very, very fast and they looked as though they were going to hit us. They were so close, in fact, I, I raised my knees because I thought the cannon fire was going to hit my legs. It didn't. My helicopter pilot obviously tried to take evasive action very quickly and he threw the helicopter over to the left. And as he threw it to the left, he dropped in height by about four or five foot which then plunged me into the ocean on the end of the wire strop. As I hit the water, all the static electricity from the helicopter shot down the wire and through my body, and it, 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 it shook me around quite, quite a bit. It dragged me through the water for what I thought was about two hours, but in fact was only about two minutes, if that. And then I was winched up fairly swiftly back into the helicopter. Given a set of headphones and the pilot said to me words of blow that Mr Fellows we're not trying that again I'm going back. It took me two or three minutes to convince him no he couldn't really do that because there was an unexploded weapon on board the Antrim which if it had it with it or when it exploded if it did was going to take the Antrim down and kill an awful lot of people and we had to try at least once again please. I started pulling away the, the wreckage and the bomb was started to roll around a little bit. The ship at this time was doing, I guessed, 20 to 30 knots and she was weaving around like a bumper car going all over the place, dodging the shells and uh, munitions coming in from the attacking aircraft. We were tossed all over the place. So I got my two guys to lie down with the backs against the walls, the bulkheads, and put their feet on the bomb and wedged their feet against the bomb to stop it rolling around. Why I went for it to uh, find a damage control locker, which fortunately was one just outside the, the toilet, uh, to get some wooden wedges to actually wedge the bomb and stop it moving around. It took quite a while, probably two, maybe three hours, to chisel the wreckage away from the back end of the bomb. We had to stop work at one stage because the fumes were getting too bad and we had to go forward and find some firefighting breathing apparatus which we donned and then went back on the task. I then got to the back end, cleared the wreckage, got to the back end of the bomb and realised that the tail end was missing. It had probably snapped off on its transit through the uh, various compartments and the back end of the bomb with its brass fuse was badly bent over. 
so much so that I couldn't see whether the arming prongs in the fuse were there or not. Now the big problem was if they weren't there the bomb was ready to go bang and the slightest knock whilst I was working on it was going to trigger it off. I knew on there I had a crew of possibly 400 people plus Royal Marines on board plus myself and my two assistants and if I made a mess up with moving the bomb I was about to kill 400 plus people. I formulated a plan when I was stopped in my tracks by a young petty officer who came down and said Mr Fellows you're wanted in the wireless room now and I said not very politely unfortunately I'm a little bit too busy to go to the wireless room now and he said Mr Fellows it is urgent I've been told to take you to the wireless room. I went to the wireless room and I was given a headset and a microphone and a voice on the other end said hello Mick this is Hamish Loudon this is a secure line you can say whatever you do it wish nobody else can understand what have you got and I said Hamish I've got a British 1000 pound bomb and he said really and I said yes really there's a little plate on the side that says made in Dudley I think 1965 high explosive so I said it's British he said but we can't help you he said we don't know we don't know what type of fuse it is it's certainly a British bomb but it could be a French fuse they have a lot of French fuses could be anything so we don't know he said but as you say if you keep it on a level keel all the time it may work he said but good luck so I said well thank you for that Tony and I thought well that's been a waste of a half an hour but he said but but I can help you in one way and I said how's that he said well I can telephone Irene he knew my wife quite well he lived just down the road in Tangmere he said I'll telephone, uh, telephone Irene and tell her what you're doing now you can imagine what my response was and I don't want to say it on air again now but it wasn't the, 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 it wasn't no please don't tell Irene I'm sat on a bomb in the middle of the Atlantic trying to defuse it don't really know what I'm doing and I'm about to kill 400 people she wouldn't appreciate that sort of thing but it was in stronger language than that what I didn't know at that time and I'll just jump in slightly here was the whole of the conversation with fleet and with Diodes had been put uh, to 10 Downing Street and was on the Tannoy system in the uh, 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 the speaker system in 10 Downing Street and had been listened to by the Prime Minister and most of the cabinet. I went back to the bottom. All the attacks stopped after dark. We were able to go closer to uh, the, the entrance and, and into calm waters. Once we were in calm waters, I gently operated the uh, pull lifts, which moved the bomb back about a foot. Then very, 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 very slowly hoisted it up through the hole cut in the flight deck uh, up to the cheer legs. My two attendants then pulled the trolley out from the aircraft hangar and we gently lowered the bomb onto the trolley and wheeled it across to the starboard side of the flight deck. On the starboard side there was a small David, which was David, like a little crane, which was used, I think, normally for hoisting low in the ship's gangway, a ladder, accommodation ladder up the ship's side, ideal. I put a bomb just below that and attached a rope tackle, block and tackle, to it and uh, got on the tannoy system and spoke to the captain on the bridge and said what my intentions are now sir is I'm going to hoist the, the bomb on the tackle and then I would like you please to go full ahead when I say and turn sharp to starboard 
And he said, can I say why, Mr. Fellows? I said, well, what I don't want when I drop this bomb is for the rope taker to wrap around your propeller <laughs> and tow the bomb behind you. And I'm not 100% sure whether the pressure on the detonator when we lower it into the water will explode it. So I said, right, I've got that, Mr. Fellows. So uh, I, I got myself ready at the end of the rope, uh, got on the tannoy system and shout, shouted to the captain, right, full ahead, please, sir, and let go of the rope. So the takel started running out with the weight of the bomb on the other end of it. The system worked. We turned to starboard. The takel ran out to its full extent, but then, then, then jammed up on a back splice that had put it, been put into the end of the rope. Fortunately, I had a fairly sharp knife, always carried a knife, being a good diver, and was able to cut the splice off the end and, and release the bomb into the sea. Fortunately, it didn't explode. As it went with splash, there was a call on the tannoy from the captain again, saying, Mr. Fellows, we've just received another signal from the CNC fleet saying that under no circumstances move the bomb, it is possibly booby-trapped. <laughs> I was invited to the victory celebrations at number 10. Quite an honour that was, I was the most junior person there, there was nobody else in the lower deck at that dinner. I met Mrs Thatcher there and had long conversations with her, I dealt with many, many bombs before in some funny situations, uh, but, but never been in a situation where I was surrounded by people and I couldn't move them to safety. I knew if I got it wrong, uh, we were going to lose a lot of lives, a lot of lives.